Welcome, everyone. This is session eight of New York Arbitration Week, and we are excited to have you. This is the combined session of NIAC and the Turner Institute New York branch, the co um, stewards of this whole week. It's my great pleasure uh, to welcome you all. My name is Rekha Rangachari, the executive director of the New York International Arbitration Center. A few organizational notes. First and foremost, please use the Q&A function to posit questions so we can have that separated from any conversations and we hope both are robust and you can put comments and the like in the chat. Q&A, questions, and the speakers can respond therewith in real time or at the end of session. This is a two hour program and there will be two CLE codes offered. So please listen carefully for them and note them down. Materials were already circulated, the CLE reading materials, the affirmation form and the evaluation form. I will post the link into the chat in case you did not receive it. These also live on the New York Arbitration Week official site under this program session. With that, um, it is my great pleasure to pass off the mic to Benno Kimmelman, chair of NIAC for our deep dive into getting it right. <laughs> Benno, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you, Reka, and thanks to the organizers of New York Arbitration Week. Uh, each year, uh, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, uh, New York branch, and NIAC work very hard to come up with engaging topics and really engaging speakers to, to deal with what we think is a, a topic of interest uh, to the international arbitration community. And I hope you will agree we have done both this year. Uh, the topic is about getting it right in international arbitration. Um, and we, we are grateful to our sponsors, our financial sponsors, our supporters, the co-chairs of New York Arbitration Week and to the various members of the organizing committee for making this possible. Uh, as Reka has said, we have two panels that are back to back. They both deal with getting it right. Uh, the first one will be chaired, will be moderated by Professor Gabrielle Kaufman Kohler. The second will be moderated by Richard Ziegler. Uh, we, their bios are in, in, in the materials that have been distributed. Uh, we couldn't have found two um, moderators who know more about getting it right than these two. So we look forward to both panels and we hope you will um, enjoy them and send us through questions if you have during both these sessions. So let me turn it over to Professor Gabrielle Kaufman Kohler. Thanks, uh, Rekha, thanks, Benno, and thanks to the organizer uh, for the invitation. The topic, as you know, is getting it right, which means how to improve the quality of the of arbitration, both in terms of process and, and outcome. Each uh, panelist will submit one and explain one idea to get it right. We will then have panel discussions about each idea. And at the end, we will take questions and comments from the audience. Uh, you have the speaker bios uh, on the website and I believe also in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just briefly say that we're very privileged to have with us Adriana Bragueta, who's a Brazilian arbitrator who practices at her boutique firm in Sao Paulo and previously was for many years at uh, El O Batista. Uh, we have also with us Yala Jimenez, uh, a Costa Rican arbitrator acting in commercial and investment arbitration, who was until last year uh, the M Minister of Foreign Trade uh, in Costa Rica. Then we have uh, Joe Newhouse, a partner at Sullivan and Cromwell, and the co, uh, co coordinator of uh, the firm's uh, arbitration practices. He specializes in international arbitration and court litigation. And I'm saying this because it will be relevant to his idea. And then we have Elliot Podbam, uh, arbitrator practicing in Washington, DC. Uh, for many years, a partners, partner at Fried Frank, where he headed the international arbitration practice. There would, of course, be much more to be said about each one of them, but uh, time is tight, and so I'm yielding the floor now uh, to for us to hear uh, the uh, panelists' 
ideas about how get to get it right. Uh, let me first give the floor to Elliot, please. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Gabrielle. Uh, so I want to introduce the topic of uh, two different approaches to argumentation that we see in international arbitration. Uh, selective argumentation versus comprehensive uh, argumentation. Uh, on the one hand, a selective approach to developing a party's uh, position entails focusing on the strong points and putting to the side the arguments that could be made, but that are considered unlikely to be strong points. Uh, on the other hand, a comprehensive presentation of the position or what we might uh, less charitably call uh, the kitchen sink approach entails making every point uh, imaginable. These are admittedly uh, very rough characterizations at the two ends of a continuum. And in most cases fall between these two extremes. But if, if I had to generalize, I think one sees argumentation closer to the comprehensive end of the spectrum. And that presents the question whether this is good for uh, sound decision making. So uh, first, let me uh, identify uh, some competing risks and benefits of these two approaches. Uh, a key benefit, an obvious key benefit of the selective approach is to achieve focus on the strongest points in a party's position uh, and not have them mixed in with a potpourri of uh, marginal assertions. And this uh, has the benefit of letting the arbitrators focus on what is most important uh, to deciding the case and to getting it right. The risk for counsel, of course, in uh, putting aside certain arguments is not making an argument that might have resonated with the tribunal. We've all seen uh, quirky takes on issues by tribunals that have surprised us. So uh, it is perhaps comfortable for counsel to say, well, look, just throw it all in and let the arbitrators decide what's a good argument and what isn't. Uh, and that's a fair point. Uh, because the arbitrators, after all, have been appointed to decide the issues and the claims in the case. But I would submit at the same time, uh, counsel have been hired to exercise their judgment as well. And the kitchen sink approach runs the risk of the strong points not getting the attention they deserve. So we need to get the right balance on the scope of argumentation. Um, so I start with the proposition that uh, it is a joint and shared responsibility of counsel and the tribunal to get the case focused on what's important. And it's not simply the responsibility of the tribunal, although it, that is a key responsibility of the tribunal. So on the, on the counsel side, uh, focus really needs to begin at the outset of the case with the request for arbitration, the answer, any counterclaims. It's important to the maximum extent possible to start with a clear eyed view of the case before submitting these important documents and just assume that it will get sorted out as the case moves along. Uh, international arbitrations are not US litigations with notice pleading, uh, early and heavy document discovery and depositions that allow counsel to figure out the case uh, over the course of a lengthy period of time. So. Uh, this really puts a premium on counsel's understanding their case at the initial pleading stage and not asserting a grab bag of marginal claims or inflated damages contentions, which in turn often lead to marginal arguments that counsel are then reluctant to relinquish as the case proceeds. Uh, then once we get to the uh, pre-hearing written process, uh, again, there is no need to make every argument uh, imaginable. Focusing on the key points will help the tribunal do its job and get to the right outcome, which after all is the objective of the process. Now, of course, the tribunal has uh, very important responsibilities in getting the case uh, focused on what matters. Uh, in a speech just a week or two ago that uh, Claudia Solomon uh, gave and that was reported in the Global Arbitration Review, uh, she highlighted the responsibility of the tribunal uh, to achieve definition of the issues that need to be resolved. And if, uh, based on the press reports anyway, it seems as though what may be on the table is the reinvigoration of the issue identification process at the terms of reference stage, a, a, um, a, a process that 
uh, has largely gone by the boards in uh, recent years and, uh, and been relegated to a formulation that the issues necessary to solve the case will be drawn from the pleadings and uh, written submissions and, and so forth. Now, uh, whether a list of issues that are key to tribunal decision-making should be compiled at the very beginning of the case or can perhaps be better defined after the parties have made their opening written submissions is a debatable point. Um, and definition of a list of issues uh, isn't necessarily frozen in time. It can evolve over the course of the case uh, as the issues get refined. But the list of issues can be a very good tool to get counsel to focus on the key points and not adopt the kitchen sink approach. And I think that can only enhance the quality of uh, tribunal decision-making. Uh, one more quick thought on uh, how to focus on uh, the key issues. It should be quick because- you, Very quick, yes, yes. I, I hate to do this, but <laughs> we had agreed on that. Uh, okay, right, uh, 30 seconds. Uh, just at the case management conference and procedural order number one stage, I think, the members of the tribunal can uh, indicate to the council that they expect focus submissions and not assertion of marginal arguments, and then perhaps even include in the uh, first procedural order uh, a statement that uh, 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 assertion of marginal arguments that don't have a reasonable foundation uh, can uh, figure in the assessment of costs. So those are a few initial thoughts just to get the discussion started. My time is passed up, so I will yield the mic. Thank you. Uh, who wants to react on, on uh, Elliot's idea? To whom do I give the floor first? Diana? Sure, good. Uh, greetings to everyone. Thank you, um, Gabrielle. I think that it's very important what Elliot is saying, and I always wonder whether the arbitrators should set out the issues they have identified as the most important before the hearing to the parties. And often arbitrators feel that it is too soon and that they could be uh, seen as prejudging the case. So that is why I think most arbitrators do that for the closing arguments. So I wanted to see what you all thought about doing it beforehand before the hearing, where, whether it's too early or too risky. Any views on this, Joe or Adriana? Very quickly, uh, to say that I think it's impossible, as Elliot was mentioning, uh, uh, and also as Claudia Solomon mentioned, it, the, the ideal world would be for us to have it on terms of reference if it's an ICC arbitration. But I think it's very difficult. Uh, parties don't have the entire case put together. They're still studying the case. So generally, we, we use that broadened word that we all know uh, uh, the template to use in the terms of reference. But I do think, I, I agree with Claudia and it, uh, responding to what uh, Diala has mentioned, that I do think that the earlier, the better. So if we, if we are able to do it in the middle of the submissions, after the first or the second round of submissions, it would be ideal. Uh, because at, by that time, we do have the answer from uh, respondents and we do have all the issues that are properly uh, uh, fought against. Uh, before that, it will be too early. And I, 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 in, I agree with you that before the hearing, it will be uh, also uh, uh, important for the parties. So any views about the right timing for a list of issue or other views? I, I think immediately before the hearing or after the last round of, of uh, memorials is likely to be too late. Uh, you know, you may have only a few weeks and a lot has already been sort of streamlined at that point, or, you know, you, especially if you're on the eve of hearing, the parties are well away, along in, in sort of designing their case. So I'm kind of with Adriana that if there's going to be two rounds of memorials with, with uh, document production in between, uh, perhaps at the end of that first round, when there's still a chance to react and for the tribunal and for the parties to try to convince you that you've missed a, a crucial point. 
Um, so I think that that I like the idea of some kind of attempt to focus things at that middle stage. One other thing I wanted to react to Elliot's points on was the difference in position between the respondent and claimant. Um, if claimant follows the kitchen sink, it's hard for respondent not to answer every point. Uh, you, you certainly, as respondent, can relegate points to you know footnotes or to you know very brief treatment, but it's pretty hard not to answer every point that's been made. I agree with that, uh, Joe. I think there's a real contagion effect that that happens if one party uh, starts with uh, the kitchen sink, then it's inevitable that uh, the other party will follow suit. Yeah, uh, let me, uh, we, we have to move on on the ideas and of course we can then revert in the discussion with, with the audience on the different points. Let me just uh, note two things that arise from the discussion. I think the idea of that the claimant sets the tone and thereafter uh, once uh, the approach taken by the claimant may well uh, may well uh, determine how uh, the whether there is selectivity or not and probably a good timing for a list of issues would be uh, after the first round before it's too early and maybe after the second round or after the hearing uh, you have missed the opportunity of narrowing down the issues. Good, should we leave it at that and we can come back afterwards. Uh, let me now turn to Diala who has another idea to improve the process. Yes, thank you. Um, I think that when you see, um, my idea is sending out draft decisions to the parties and whether this would help to get it right. And when you see the Wyden case and Queen Mary survey, the last one, it states that a recurring theme in interviews was the sense that arbitration is becoming increasingly over formalistic at the expense of efficiency. So getting it right has to do also with efficiency still. And um, so one way of reducing oral hearings on procedural issues which was something that 38% of the respondents of that survey said they were willing to do without, is uh, to send out drafts of procedural orders. So I'm not referring, of course, only to the first procedural order that is typically sent out to the parties, but rather um, to orders that solve procedural and interim issues throughout the life of the arbitration. And at times, Parties are stuck on issues that are accessory, but they're important and even sometimes quite complex. And resolving them can take time and disrupt the proceedings. And at times, exchange of written communications is enough uh, to, for the arbitral tribunal to understand the issues and resolve them. But sometimes tribunals need to make sure that they hit the mark and that they're actually grasping the whole, um, everything that is at stake on that particular issue. And if parties are willing to forego procedural hearings or oral hearings on those issues, and arbitrators sometimes feel that the hearings are disruptive or actually that they, the, the conflict in their schedules will make the hearing not timely, um, one practice I find helpful is to send out procedural orders in draft form to the parties. And uh, the procedural order will become effective within a certain time limit uh, if parties do not object to it or do not comment on it. Or if by common agreement they modify an aspect, then that new part will become part of the procedural order. If, of course, one party objects, the tribunal will thereafter uh, render the final decision. Um, and this idea also is related to the need of what Elliot was saying. Um, I think the tribunal needs to understand the case as it evolves. And, and this way, both the procedural and the substantive aspects are evolving at the same time. Now on draft awards, on the other hand, um, I, this has been discussed before. Sometimes it's, it's uh, suggested and it comes usually from the WTO practice 
And it is in, in some uh, treaties like the CAFTA and the japan Colombia uh, Bilateral Investment Treaty. And uh, in the case of investment uh, treaties or chapters in the FTAs, as opposed to the WTO practice, the draft award has to be uh, sent out only at the request of a party. So I have not had experience with sending out draft awards, but as I thought about this practice and this idea to get it right, some questions came to my mind and I, I want to share them with you. If this rule were to be expanded, should it apply to all awards, partial awards, awards or decisions or awards on jurisdictions or just final awards? And if it were applied to all awards, wouldn't this prolong the process unnecessarily? But on the other hand, would this entice settlement? Uh, the other question, if, if there is a dissenting arbitrator, should the draft include the dissent or rather should the draft be anonymous and without the dissent? And would it actually prevent dissenting opinions, this practice? Um, then if it were a practice, what would they do with the draft? Could the parties comment on it? Could the parties only ask for corrections of facts, for example? What if they agree on modifications that the tribunal is not really entirely uh, comfortable with? Are they bound? Would the arbitrators be bound by it? And um, could this be done in ICC proceedings where there's already a scrutiny process that actually works uh, quite well and prevents a lot of, of addenda and additional awards? And finally, what about leakage of the award? So the WTO website itself states that although the interim report in that case mm -hmm. is confidential, one or more of the parties often leak its content to the press. So I think um, this uh, practice all in all, and um, you know, I'm not sure it could pass a muster on the cost benefit analysis, but I think it's good to work uh, on data and see if this practice really aims at getting it right, if it leads to shorter awards, uh, or if we can do something in the middle. Thank you. Thank you it's it's a, an interesting idea. Uh, let me see what the reactions are. Who wants to start? I, I'm, yes. I'm, 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 I'm very skeptical of the idea of uh, circulating uh, draft awards. Um, I mean, what is the circumstance under which uh, uh, the tribunal would be concerned about getting additional uh, uh, views of the parties. It would seem to me uh, it would be when the tribunal is uncertain uh, about how to handle a particular issue or a particular claim. And if that's the case, I think a simpler approach and a less risky approach is simply to put questions to the parties and ask them to uh, respond in writing. In fact, it's quite common uh, that at the close of the hearing, uh, the tribunal will put specific questions uh, to the parties and ask them to address them in the post-hearing briefs. Uh, and similarly, even after the briefs have come in on occasion to put uh, further questions to them. So I, I think it's, uh, the, I would be extremely cautious about doing uh, something like this. And I think it, it, it also runs the risk. Let, let's say you circulate the draft award and, and uh, parties comment on it, and then there's a change of position uh, in, in the award as a result of the commentary. Now, if it's just simply getting a fact uh, corrected, that, that's one thing, but if the, it affects the outcome of the case, then you have to wonder uh, whether uh, the arbitrators are reacting to something that they got wrong in the first instance and are correcting it, or whether they're just changing their minds. Uh, and that I think is, fraught with risk and, and in particular, uh, if the award is subject to uh, post uh, hearing proceedings in courts, what does this do to the strength of the award? Uh, I mean, what, I suppose one could say that uh, if the award has been commented on and fixed, that strengthens it. On the other hand, uh, the, a reviewing court might not have a lot of confidence in the uh, quality of the award uh, where there's been that type of change. I, I don't know, but I, I'm, I'd be very cautious. Okay, so, <laughs> good. Is anyone else wants to comment, Joe? I, I, I basically concur with Elliot that 
you know, it sounds great in theory, but uh, when I thought about whether I would do it, I don't think I would do it um, for all the reasons that Elliot uh, identified. You know, parties are going to want to re re-argue the case. So if I did do it, I would put page limits on any response. Um, and and even then, uh, if they do convince you, I mean, you know, on the one hand, if they if they do convince you to change your mind, all right, then you should have then you made an error probably. On the other hand, you have to reopen the proceeding. You've got to let the other side respond, and you've got to you know uh, kind of go give a adequate due process. So it seems um, you know like it's not going to happen in real life. I think on procedural decisions, sure. But even here, uh, you know, I'm, I don't think you do it with a stern schedule or red fern. I don't think you, you give people a chance to argue with you about it. Um, but maybe I, I've never never seen that done with red ferns. But it's you know it's possible you could do that. Frankly, on red ferns, I'm often feeling like I'm not really sure what the right answer is. I don't know the case very well, and I'm kind of taking a little bit of a stab in the dark as to to what I'm doing there. So it might not be a terrible thing to give people a chance. Here's what I'm planning to do. Let me know if I've screwed it up. You have two pages to convince me. Adriana, you're very short. Uh, I, you're very short. Sure. I agree with yeah, Ari, Elliot and Joseph. I think it's too risky, too bold to do it. And we will have, uh, it's likely that in civil law countries, we will have uh, 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 due process issues and attempts to set aside the proceeding because of prejudgment if we wish uh, uh, issue those awards. But uh, in, in my experience as counsel, once I had received not the decision itself, but a long list of all the facts that the Arbitral Tribunal deemed very relevant to the case, and the parties, it was a construction case, and the parties had the opportunity to comment on it. Is there a missing fact, or did I misunderstood the facts? I think that was a brilliant idea from the chair. And uh, in terms of efficiency, in another case, uh, to avoid uh, uh, the delay, the Arbitral Tribunal decided the jurisdiction matter orally it's not uh, a draft, it was the decision itself. So the, 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 the arbitration was ready to move on without some parties uh, uh, that would not participate and the written decision was issued four months after. I think this could happen, but not quite the other's idea. I'm a little bit concerned about it. No, yeah. please don't I call it a lot of concern. Yala, uh, I need to stop you there. And I'm sorry because I'm sure you want to defend your idea. Hopefully, someone will ask you a question later on. Uh, we see it's it's not an uninteresting idea. Uh, certainly, uh, you, one should not do it unless there is either an agreement of the parties or a, a treaty rule. And certainly, if there are cases where it would not uh, would not work. It can also, uh, from experience, I can say it can uh, improve the quality of the award, I think. But uh, it, it's a difficult proposition. Let's move to the next one, uh, which is uh, Adriana's idea. Please. Okay. Adriana. So, so uh, uh, I, I was left, left with the question how the institutions can help with the idea of getting it right. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, efficiency and tools, how to conduct the proceedings and to expedite the proceedings and reduce the cost, because I think uh, the art institutions have dealt with it uh, very well in the last few years. And, uh, and my idea is also not to talk about the scrutiny of the award. I think certainly the scrutiny of the award, the way the ICC does it, it helps the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the quality of the award. But we've been discussing for a long time uh, that idea as well, uh, and some institutions do not do it. What I'd like to, 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 to present to you, to submit to you, would be to uh, the idea of uh, ongoing education to arbitrators. 
the main idea, one might say, you know, Adriana, there's no need because, you know, we, we only uh, nominate an arbitrator if we think he is or he or she is uh, totally expert on the issue. Uh, that's one point. But uh, I think the idea first is to prepare the next generation. It's very important. It's one of the main aspects of the institutions also to broaden the, the pool of arbitrators. Second, if uh, Gabriel, uh, if we take the example of the task force, ICA task force on damages, and I'm trying to, to discuss uh, substantive issues in the arbitration. I think the task force on damages was a very good example. It attracted a lot of attention. So uh, I remember in one of the meetings, Pierre Tessier was there. Even a truly experienced arbitrator is willing to listen and pay attention to important issues uh, uh, that will be dealt in the, the merits of the case. So there is also the willing from also experienced arbitrators to participate. And finally, obviously, the law changes all the time, sometimes jurisprudence, it's also would be good to have a, a, a catch up on those issues. I also bring an example to show to you what I was thinking about, the issue of the COVID, the issue of the pandemic, pandemic situation. Most likely there are hundreds of arbitration cases nowadays going on in which parties are alleging hardship. Would it be interesting for us to discuss among arbitrators. And uh, one may say, you know, but uh, IBA already does that in their special committees uh, on m and uh, construction law, construction cases, and various committees that R RBA has. But the idea that I'm trying to submit here is to bring those discussions from uh, special committees into the arbitration committee, let's say, broadly speaking. So uh, I think uh, uh, it's hard to say that uh, ongoing education would be bad. And I think sometimes the arbitral community is a little bit tired of discussing only arbitral issues in terms of efficiency and improvement of the procedure itself. But I think we, we uh, not only other institutions like ICA, like CRB, and many academic institutions can provide that uh, approach, but I think there is a room for arbitral institutions to do so. That's my pleading, Gabriel. Thank you. Uh, as you say, I, I doubt ever, anyone would ever say that uh, education is bad. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, experienced arbitrators can also benefit from the thinking uh, that goes on and from education. Any, uh, any reactions or particular ide ideas of how, uh, how education could be framed? Well, I, I, um, I would point to the uh, panel that was heard earlier this week on Monday, I think it was, uh, 10 tips on uh, writing uh, awards. This was from the ICC perspective, but I thought it was a superior job by the uh, panelists in going through a whole host of different uh, issues that arbitrators need to keep in mind and take into account uh, when they're drafting uh, awards. I mean, they, they focused on the ICC checklist as the first tip, as, as I recall. Uh, uh, and, and that checklist, I think, has general applicability uh, for other uh, settings uh, in which international arbitrations take place. But then they, they uh, uh, I don't remember all 10 of the, the tips that they gave, but uh, there was the, the ICC checklist that was setting out um, the procedural history in the award. It was making sure that the points that are made in the award are reasoned and not simply conclusory, that there are appropriate citations to the record, that the uh, arbitrators make sure that they're taking into account costs, interest, and then that the dispositive portion of the award uh, is careful uh, to decide 
all the claims, but not to decide more than the claims uh, and to make sure that the math is right. I mean, those are all good general guidelines. And I think that uh, was an, an excellent educational process for the benefit of uh, arbitrators. And I think it fits in line with what Adriana is saying uh, on the benefit of uh, continuing uh, education for arbitrators. And as Gabrielle pointed out, even the most experienced arbitrators can benefit from that type of uh, instruction. I have a question. Sorry, Adriana, I have a question. Do you mean that we could get a similar a credit, like a CLE arbitrators could get points and a, 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 is that, I have that question. And another idea for institutions is to give arbitrators feedback on their performance uh, very readily. And that way we can improve, you know, and I think it's a lot of effort on the part of the institution, but that's another thing. But I wanted to ask that to Adriana, whether it would be similar to CLE so that you can have kind of the obligation to stay tuned and stay informed of the new. It's, I think it's a good idea, Diala, but not necessarily. I think uh, it could be, we could, we could create various sorts of, different sorts of programs. But my, my only reaction was, there's plenty of educational opportunities out there. And what would be different about the institutions doing it is if they did something like what Diala was suggesting, you know, some kind of you either, you know, if you want to stay on our on our roster, you need to to have credits, and that would be new and different, and something that institutions alone can do. The only other thought I had is that with respect to the substantive law, it varies, especially in commercial arbitration, so much. There really isn't, you know, a, a sort of pre-existing body of law that arbitrators, you know, uniformly need, uh, except maybe in areas of damages like DCF and interest. Um, but, you know, the substantive law that governs the resolution of a particular uh, commercial dispute tends to be very, very one off. At least that's my impression. I think I cannot comment. Yeah, can I? you have the final word here. Sorry, can, may I? Yes. What, one very quick comment on Elliot's. I think you're right. Uh, it's difficult in commercial arbitration, but that is the point. In also in commercial arbitration, everything is under uh, uh, it's under confidential agreement most of the cases. So we need to, to the, the the idea behind the awards, the, the reasoning in the awards, somehow need to be heard by other players, especially arbitral tribunals. It's the idea of uh, 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 analyzing in depth civil law. And I also agree, uh, Joseph, when you mentioned, when we, we are discussing monetary correction, interest rates, evaluation of companies, evaluation of expropriation claims, there are all, all sorts of uh, different approaches that could be uh, somehow uh, further discussed. Uh, again, the project from ICA about damages was fantastic. And, and goes, it, it's, it's helpful for, not only for, for investment arbitration, but for commercial arbitration as well. Good, thank you. I think uh, we, we have a number of uh, avenues here. Maybe it's for institutions to think about it. I would a little be worry of, uh, about institutions giving feedback on, on substantive application of the law or substantive reasoning. I find this would somehow go beyond the, uh, the uh, mission of the institution, which is to administer arbitration. And it may just, it may, might also be just uh, too challenging because of what Joe, uh, mentioned that there are so many different uh, uh, disputes, legal issues, applicable laws and the like. But having said that, let's move on and get to uh, the uh, fourth idea, which is uh, Joe's idea and it's entitled Episodic Justice. Right, it's called The Virtues of Episodic Justice. <laughs> Yes. I've done a, a little essay on it, uh, which is in the materials, if you can uh, find your way to it. Um, the idea is that arbitral tribunals should consider measures for partial dispositive relief 
or bifurcation of preliminary issues or damages into separate instances. And here's the important part, even without a showing that there's likely to be any efficiency gain. And the idea is that taking the case in small bites rather than all at once can often lead to a better, more carefully considered decision. In, the, the problem that I see is that in arbitration, the same messy case that, go, that you have at the outset of the case goes to arbitration, typically goes to hearing as originally pled. If there was a fraud and a breach of warranty claim, the fraud claim, even though it may be really quite weak, goes all the way to hearing and then gets argued at length at the hearing. Or there are factual allegations that turn out to be accurate, inaccurate, or there are the question of pre-arbitration procedures, was there enough, enough negotiation or, or discussion before the arbitration was begun, is often you know, just combined with the hearing and then may take up hearing time. Um, and that's because in arbitration, there's no real opportunity for paring down a case unless one can show a likely gain in efficiency. You, you will get bifurcation usually only if there's a good chance of avoiding a hearing. Um, if you're going to need to try a breach of warranty claim, you might as well keep fraud in the case because you'll, you'll have to go to hearing anyway. You'll never get what we would call in U.S. procedure partial summary judgment to, to strike out the, the, uh, the, the fraud claim. Now, efficiency is good, and focusing fixedly on efficiency is also a good thing, but we may be overlooking other benefits of considering aspects of the case in small chunks. Um, and this is something we do see in US practice with motions to dismiss and summary judgment motions. They take time without question, um, but they are frequently only partially successful. You don't avoid a trial, but you do take the case in little chunks. And I see three benefits. One is culling out bad claims that clutter the hearing and divert attention from what matters. I looked at cases that had litigated whether a tribunal that had corrected an award had the power to do so under the functus officio doctrine and found, not surprisingly, that the error that the tribunal tried to fix arose from an issue that had gotten only passing attention in a long hearing or in a long memorial. The second factor is related to the first, uh, which is one is paring down so that you can focus, and the other is the focus factor. You can give real attention to the issues that are separately decided. What are the standards for asserting a, a fraud claim? When exactly are pre-arbitration steps jurisdictional? What interest rate will apply? All of these will get greater attention in a hearing or briefing devoted to those issues. And the third benefit that is not efficiency is feedback. Uh, if there are episodic decisions during the course of the arbitration, you increase chances of settlement where the parties get real time and real feedback from the tribunal on whether their theories are, are, are flying or not. So that's a summary of the idea. As I say, I developed it a little bit more in a short essay. Thank you. Uh, reactions. Well, I would put I would put on a plug for uh, Joe's essay. I've read it; it's excellent, and commend it to uh, all of the uh, uh, folks in the audience. Uh, one question, uh, Joe: I, I I agree with you that uh, on this efficiency obsession that one finds in the arbitration community, I think it's a bit uh, overdone. But in in so that the process doesn't get bogged down in motion practice, uh, like we see in 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 the uh, U.S. courts, for example. Would you require at least a relatively high bar uh, to show that there's a, a reasonable likelihood of success uh, on the uh, particular claim or the particular issue that is uh, sought to be presented? I, I would definitely preserve the arbitral tribunal's gatekeeping function on this. That's something we don't have in, in US court practice. Anybody can bring a motion to dismiss. Some judges have instituted some gatekeeping on this. So I would definitely preserve the gatekeeping function. And yes, you know, uh, you should have some reasonable prospect of success and, and you know, it should be a relatively significant issue. Some of the ones I gave you examples of are not always very significant, 
but um, but yes, some gatekeeping functions should be should be maintained without question. I have a question, Joe. Would 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 that entail the risk of not seeing the big picture and and maybe taking long? way too long in deciding the entire dispute and maybe having to go back if something happens. That's my first question. And my second is whether you think that limiting page number in the submissions could also additionally or uh, rather get everyone to focus on the important issues or the important aspects. I, I think on the first question, um, you know, you have to pick the right issues. But I do think, I mean, for example, fraud and a breach of warranty claim. You know, fraud, they, they defrauded me and they just breached their warranty, some contractual dispute. You know, fraud has is pretty high standard. And you, even though those are very bound up factually, you could decide a question of, of is the fraud claim well-founded or not at the outset. Um, certainly US courts do so in part because fraud has a high pleading standard. On page limits on the main submissions, uh, I have done that. I've tried to do it, um, and uh, you know I think it does help focus things. What really happened is, you know, the, the witness statements just got really long. Uh, the memorial was whatever I said, but the witness statements got really long. Um, so, uh, you know, I think and my own view is I, I am sort of a fan of page limits. I think it does focus everybody, um, but it is also something that's use, useful only in the right case. You can reduce the hearing days, and then you reduce the, the witness evidence again. But uh, <clears throat> yes, other reactions? I did not you're on mute. You're muted. Sorry. I like it very much, Joe's idea. Uh, I still like the mainstream approach, which is in the normal case, at the outside, outside, outside of the proceeding, you try to have uh, or to, to discuss with the parties when the hearing will take place and probably discuss all the issues. But there are some certain cases in which, uh, and here's the difference, Joe, for, in my opinion, for efficiency purposes also, you may need to discuss a preliminary issue. For the avoidance of spending thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars with expert examinations, if you have to discuss if there was a waiver or a stop before that to bring that claim. Uh, in cases like this, it's just one example that I'm dealing with right now as an arbitrator. The parties have requested that prior to uh, go moving forward, we have some certain preliminary issues that goes into the heart of the proceedings, why not pay attention to that, have a special hearing for that, solve those issues and move forward. I like, but uh, uh, again, uh, uh, not to prolong every single case, it, it, it must be used in special situations, I would suggest. I have to say, I really like your point about uh, if there's an issue of expert evidence that is contingent on some prior decision, Trying to figure out a way to, to decide that in advance is a great idea because experts, you know, just take the case in a whole new direction if they're not, and often are not necessary. May I ask a question, uh, uh, Joe? Um, do, do you en envisage uh, the members of the tribunal taking a proactive role in encouraging uh, the identification of issues that can be teed up for? Uh, early disposition, or would you uh, envisage rather that uh, the tribunal sit back and wait for the parties to raise that type of question? I think typically it will be the parties uh, because it's kind of it's, it needs to be addressed quite early. Uh, you know, that is, are you going to hive off the the fraud claim or or the like? It needs to be addressed quite early, and the and the the, the parties are in a better position to do that. Um, but you know, if, if, if it's sort of after the first round of pleadings hits you over the head and the arbitrators say, you know, look, why don't we, you know, cut off the, the expert evidence entirely because I don't think this is going to be useful. I could see doing that. And I've done things that are similar to that, uh, where we try to focus things early on. 
very interesting ideas. Uh, and this one obviously uh, would require a lot of thinking. There, there are some risks involved and there are uh, obvious benefits. Maybe the same thing, which is really narrowing down the issues and concentrating on the main uh, points uh, goes very much in the same direction like Elliot's initial thought about uh, comprehensive versus selective uh, argumentation. There's this more selective resolution of issues. Um, now, it is time, um, it's not my role here to speak, so but, uh, it is time to open up for comments and questions from the audience. I'm sure your ideas will have raised a lot of, uh, of thoughts. And uh, I think it was Benno who was uh, uh, planning to let us know what the questions are. Indeed, Gabrielle. Uh, and there's one, there was one question that was just asked that reminds me that earlier this week, there was conversation about the interaction between uh, courts and arbitral tribunals and how sometimes courts try to mimic what tribunals do successfully and vice versa. And so I guess one question was asked that was asked is that in the London High Court, uh, there's a practice of circulating confidentially draft judgments to counsel to correct mistakes. And I know that in the United States there, I, I believe I had seen over the years that in the California state courts, there was the very same practice. And it worked amazingly well because mistakes are picked up by counsel. If the, if the contours of what's being asked counsel to do are clear, um, it, it, it can be successful. And so the question that was asked was, can't we in international arbitration learn something from what some courts do successfully? I, I, I've I've experienced... go. Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. I, I've experienced this in the London High Court just recently. Um, and it was remarkable uh, how the barristers, you know, were so cooperative. And there's mm -hmm. just this very high degree of shared understanding of expectations between the court and the barristers in England, which I will tell you, I don't think we have in the United States, and we certainly don't have in the arbitration world. At the WTO, the practice is that the draft report is sent to the parties for, and the parties usually just focus on the corrections, and it seems to work except for the confidentiality issue. So I think there are more risks, honestly, involved in sending out drafts. Um, but I think Adriana called attention to a case where she had that, right? You're, if I understood correctly, the arbitrator sent just that part of the facts. So I guess, you know, I think there are more risks and maybe I was not explaining myself well. I don't think it's a great idea for a host of reasons, especially if you have scrutiny in some institutions. Obviously, I think international arbitration can also learn, can certainly learn uh, in some cases from, from courts, but we should not forget that we are in a completely global transnational environment with people who have very different backgrounds and they all need to work together. And, and uh, so that makes it more difficult because there's not no shared expectations and uh, as, as, as Joe noted. And in addition, I would say the arbitrators do not have the, set, the authority of a national court. They're very much dependent on the uh, trust of the parties and the cooperation of the parties. And that makes it more difficult because uh, you can think of all types of uh, maneuvers uh, to obstruct the issuance of the final award uh, in case one party is disappointed by the draft it gets. I'm not speaking of order, procedural orders. That's a different uh, Situation, although one could also think of disqualification requests, for instance, and these are very efficient in blocking, uh, blocking the arbitration for some time at least. So, so uh, to be thought about. Ben, are there other questions? Yes, there was another one about uh, Joe's suggestion, and that is really the question about um, 
it sounded like the, the proposal had focused on things like bifurcation on the one hand and what some institutions now have called uh, applications for early determination, which look like uh, motions in the US, we would call the motions for summary judgment. And, and the question, I guess, really is, um, is there any other way to really accomplish the same thing? Uh, for instance, could you, um, and, and of course the, bear, the, 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 the burden to establish early determination is very high. It's very difficult to succeed on such an application, but that y your proposal looks at the early stage of the arbitration. What about looking at a little bit later on in the arbitration and sequencing issues? sequencing them in a way that that allows the briefing to be more focused and and maybe achieve the proposal of issues being more clearly identified uh, allowing the tribunal to take issues in a bite-sized fashion so that interest for instance is given a lot of it is given the attention it deserves and not one paragraph at the end of a brief that, that has a page limit of let's say 75 pages wouldn't that be helpful as well, and, and that's the question. And maybe what I would add to it is, aren't a lot of these proposals valuable to be done together because they all are helpful in different kinds of cases of getting the tribunal position to um, address the issues properly? Uh, so, you know, my answer is yes, 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 all of the above. Um, and, and, you know, bifurcation is only one form of trying to take the case in small bites. One thing you could do is have parallel briefing. Um, brief the issue, I mean, uh, of pre-arbitral procedures, were they followed or not? If you don't really think that's likely to gain traction, you could have it briefed while the briefings on the merits goes forward if you have you know, some level of confidence that, that that briefing on the merits is likely to be useful. So you can you could sequence issues, that is A, comes first and then B and then C, or you can have A and B run in parallel. And while B, the much bigger issue is being decided, uh, still brief, the tribunal you know, steps aside and decides issue A. It really will depend on how issues interlink in the case. Just listening about the sequencing, uh, we, what we have not really uh, made good use of so far is the technology. Now we have, uh, we can have uh, online hearings. That makes it much easier to have separate uh, uh, hearings about one issue. And then two, two months later, you can have another issue. Uh, this is not the same thing when you have uh, to have in-presence hearing with everyone traveling from all over the world and the costs that are involved in that. So maybe we should also think about the technology as a way of uh, making things uh, more efficient in the, in, the, in the meaning of improving the quality, uh, that is efficiency in the broad sense, not just speed. Other, and, let, uh, and let me add one piece of information that everyone's waiting for with bated breath, and that is the CLE code. Um, <laughs> the code is law. 306 L A W 306. Uh, except for the CLE code, are there other uh, other comments or questions? I see we have one minute left. There's one comment in the in the QA that I see. I don't know whether I don't know I have any information about this. Do the panelists have any experience in using the Goldman formula during the terms of reference? Yes. And in fact, that's pretty much all we use in the terms of reference these days. It, I mean, it used to be that lit issues would get identified in the terms of reference. I think it's pretty seldom that one sees that now. And, and it's the Goldman formula that uh, that prevails. The Goldman formula is, is that I didn't know what it was. All right. Oh. That, that's the formula where it says the, the arbitrators will uh, resolve the issues that are, are put to them or, or, or which they may raise themselves. It says essentially nothing, right? Yeah. Exactly. exactly. It, it, it kicks Very the can well. down the road. 
my universal experience. I just hadn't, didn't know it had a, a lovely name. <laughs> But that uh, leads us to the end, I think. Uh, it's just uh, on the hour, and uh, it remains to me to thank all the panelists, of course, and all those who uh, attended. And uh, Benno, I don't know whether you wish to say something at the end. Yes, I, just to thank you, Gabrielle, and thank the entire panel. It's been, it's been our pleasure, our honor to have you. And uh, now the back-to-back -back panel, which will be moderated by Richard Ziegler, will pick up with the functus officio doctrine and, and what happens when, in the rare circumstance, there really is some sort of error that has occurred in the award, and, and, and the question is what to do. Uh, thank you so much, and Richard, I turn it over to you. Richard, one moment before you do that, we're gonna just do a little bit of a changing of the guards. Delegates, hold on while we do that. Okay then, Rika, are we ready to roll? I believe we are. And you can indicate if you'd like to pull up that first poll, Richard. Oh, we're not getting to the first poll quite yet. First, I get to do a little introduction, but thank you. Um, so stand by for the prompting for that first poll. Um, one thing uh, I wanna start by welcoming everyone to this second panel on getting it right, and it's sponsored by the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, New York branch and the New York International Arbitration Center. I'm on behalf of all the panelists, uh, we had a lot of fun putting this together and we thank the organizers for getting us together and to all the sponsors of New York Arbitration Week for making this happen. And uh, I certainly wanna compliment panel one for some truly innovative thinking. I wasn't anticipating hearing, frankly. So for panel two, we have a wonderfully cosmopolitan panel. It reflects varying perspectives of arbitration practitioners, neutrals, and academics. Uh, frankly, I thought I knew quite a bit about the functus officio doctrine before I met with the panelists in preparation for this afternoon, but I learned a lot more. I expect that many of you will too. So my first order of business here is to introduce our panelists. Before I do that, I must say, the organizers scheduled this for 12 to 2 without a uh, restroom break. So I'm assuming our uh, group of attendees, we have uh, at the moment 135 of you participating in this panel. You'll just choose a dull moment to, uh, to do what you need to do. We'll, we'll excuse you for that and also we'll, we'll never know. Uh, so introducing our panelists. I'm going to go in alphabetical order. There are slightly longer bios for them in the written materials that you may have downloaded, but in case you're not, not uh, downloading them, I'm going to devote two sentences to each of them so you will know uh, who's speaking with you. Uh, in alphabetical order, first, Martin Guzzi is a dual licensed common law, civil law disputes attorney and arbitrator, and he leads the international arbitration practice at the global law firm Bracewell. He's a New Yorker since 2007. He's a lot older than that, though. Martin has also practiced in his native Frankfurt, Singapore, Paris, Houston, and Sao Paulo. It's, uh, I must say, it's hard to limit each of these people to two sentences, but uh, I've done it. Two sentences on Eduardo Silva Romero. Eduardo is the co chair of the international practice group at the global law firm Deckard, based in its Paris office. Uh, he teaches arbitration law at three different renowned French universities, and he was the Deputy Secretary General of the ICC Court from 2000 to 2004, and Vice Chair of the ICC Commission on Arbitration and ADR, 2007 to 2017. Next, Janet Walker is an independent arbitrator with chambers in Toronto, London, and Sydney, and a professor at the Osgoode Hall Law School in Toronto. Janet is chair of the ICC Canada National Committee and just finished co-chairing Canada's arbitration week. So there's a little rivalry. We're delighted that Janet is participating in New York and Canada's arbitration weeks. 
Lastly, Anne-Marie Weitzel is the faculty director of the Program on International Arbitration and Dispute Resolution at Georgetown University Law Center in Washington, D.C., and an active arbitrator and counsel in international arbitrations. Before joining Georgetown, Anne-Marie practiced at Deckert LLP, where Eduardo is today, in Washington and Paris, and was secretary general of the ICC International Court of Arbitration from 2001 to 2007. So, if you've been paying attention so far and you're back from your restroom break, you know that Eduardo was deputy SG during the first half of that his tenure. And finally, uh, I'm going to put in my two sentences. Uh, for the past several years, I've devoted full time to serving as arbitrator in domestic and international cases. Before that, I spent 20 years as a litigation partner in the New York office of Cleary Gottlieb Hamilton dozen years as co-head of the International Arbitration Practice Group at General Block in New York. And in between those two experiences, as outside counsel, I spent five years in-house as the general counsel of the 3 company in St. Paul, Minnesota. So we are now ready to do our uh, first poll, uh, which is intended to take, uh, but before you answer it, let me, let me uh, let me just make a mea culpa here. We want to get a baseline of, of the audience's experience with the Funtus Officio Doctrine and the provider rules that are rooted in it uh, and what you think about it. So we have two poll questions, but I'm going to make one confession first. I've spent many years as a practitioner handling arbitrations and litigation without ever having heard of the phrase Funtus Officio. And in my experience as arbitrator more recently, my sense is that many of the lawyers who appear before me are wholly unaware of this corner of the law. So all of that is to say there's no shame in responding no to the first poll, but now it's first poll time. First poll, do you have any firsthand experience with the application of the functus officio doctrine or administrative institutions slip rules that limit post-award revisions? You can choose yes or you can choose no. Suppose I'm in Michelle's hands at FTI as to how long the first poll is on our screen before we turn to the second Okay, so we have our first poll results. Uh, so very interestingly, it's almost a one third, two thirds split. 34% have some firsthand experience and uh, two thirds of you do not. Uh, lucky for the two thirds who do not, um, as we're about to go into. Uh, Michelle, if you could put up the second poll. The second poll, do you believe that existing institutional rules that limit the scope of post-award revisions are appropriate as is or should be reformed? Your answer choices, yes, leave well enough alone or no, reform is warranted. Please let us know your views on that one. Oh, whenever you're ready to take it down and give us results, we're interested to see them. Okay, 60% of the group thinks let's leave well enough alone and 40% thinks well reform is warranted that we obviously should have done a demographic uh, analysis because it's quite possible that that 40% overlaps more than 100% with the 34% of you who've actually had experience with these rules or the Funtus Officio Doctrine, but we're not going to know that because we didn't think to ask that background question. Anyway, we'll see if we're going to take this poll again uh, at uh, two o'clock and we'll see whether the results remain 60 40. 
So it's now uh, the rest of my job is to just tee up our issue. So um, as you know, the theme of New York Arbitration Week at these panels is getting it right. And the functus officio doctrine is directly pertinent because it limits a tribunal's ability after issuing an award to change it, even if the tribunal has become convinced that it made a material error. This is not solely a theoretical issue. Numerous reported cases address arbitrators' attempt to correct errors. And some of those reported cases, including two quite recent ones right here in the center of New York Arbitration Week, in New York State Supreme in Lower Manhattan, and the Southern District of New York down the block in Lower Manhattan, held that the arbitrator wasn't permitted to change his or her mind. The tribunal couldn't do it. Uh, if there's time at the end of this, we're happy to discuss those two cases. You will uh, find them referenced and discussed at length in the city bar report that is among the, the CLE materials. But frankly, those two cases from 2019 and 2020 spurred the city bar's arbitration committee, uh, which was then chaired by uh, New York Arbitration Week organizing member Steve Scola, uh, to do a deep dive into the functus officio and the provider rules that are rooted in them, uh, which, by the way, for purposes of that report and for this program, we're referring to as slip rules. Um, and they published a white paper in April of 2021 um, that provides a wonderful historical background if you're interested in history. Functus officio goes back to the 1200s, who knew? And as I say, it remains vibrant. Uh, analyzes the recent cases and it concludes with a suggested reform proposal for providers to modify their slip rules. It's called the Functus Officio Problem in Modern Arbitration and Proposed Solution. You will find it in the CLE materials that you can download. If you don't do that, just go to the New York City Bar website at nycitybar.org, do a search term for Functus. You don't think you need to add Officio and you will find it. So the institutional, we're going to be discussing that uh, reform proposal. Uh, and we'll see what the panel thinks of it. Um, I will say, in addition to the considerable input from Steve Skolnick as chair of the committee that produced the report, uh, the city report bar report owes a lot to uh, Mark Goldstein uh, and other members of the committee. Mark uh, served with me as the co-chair of the drafting subcommittee for that report. Uh, last point I want to make is um, uh, the institutional providers all reflect this vitality of the functus officio doctrine by including in their provider rules a limitation on the timing and scope of post award efforts by parties or the tribunal itself uh, to revise awards. So these slip rules have uh, up to three different. Uh, identification of their scope. One that they all share is the ability to correct a clerical, typographical, or computational error. Some of them go on to expand that a little bit to add the phrase, quote, errors of similar nature, close quote, whatever that may mean. And the fact that we don't necessarily know what that means leads to issues that we're going to get to in a moment on whether these provider rules work so well. And several, but by no means all of them, expressly allow a tribunal either to, quote, interpret, close quote, an award, to, quote, clarify, close quote, an award, or to correct, quote, any ambiguity or any mistake of a similar nature, close quote, in an award. So those quotes respectively interpret, you'll find in the ICDR rules, the ICC rules, the HKIAC rules. CPR uses the clarify verb, and the LCIA uses the correct any, any ambiguity or similar mistake phrase. But if you look at the AAA rules, the JAMS rules, the UNSA trial rules, you don't find any authorization to uh, clarify or interpret an ambiguous award. If you practice in the Second Circuit, at least, uh, the Second Circuit has interpreted uh, 
the functus officio doctrine to allow a tribunal to interpret an ambiguous award. That leads us to our first question for the panel, which is the pros and cons of this 900 plus year old doctrine and the provider rules that um, are rooted in it, sort of reflect it. We'll get into that issue in a moment. But let me start. Uh, this is a topic for Anne Marie and, and Martin in the first instance. Anne Marie, tell us what you view the advantages of the functus officio doctrine and the provider rules are. Thank you very much, Richard. I, I'd like to start by also thanking the organizers of this New York Arbitration Week for having invited me to be here today. And I want to also thank Richard for having uh, done such an excellent job of organizing our discussion. Um, so Richard, as you've correctly identified what we mean by uh, the term functus officio, it's historically uh, been understood to mean that an officer or, or an official body once having accomplished its intended task, loses its authority or legal competence. Uh, so for arbitration, what that means that subject to very narrowly defined exceptions, arbitrators are prevented from substantively modifying their awards once such awards have been rendered. And slip rules, again, are intended to provide that same function of ensuring the finality of the arbitrator's decisions on substantive issues. Now, what are the advantages? Why should functus officio continue to exist? Uh, I'd say the main reason for this comes from the nature of arbitration itself, because one of the principal advantages of international arbitration is its finality. And parties choose this type of dispute resolution because they want to get a decision that is final and binding with very limited grounds for appeal. And we find this coming from uh, this binding nature of arbitration and arbitral awards coming from the New York Convention, from national laws, in the Union's trial model law, we see it stated that the mandate of the arbitral tribunal terminates with the termination of the arbitral proceedings, of course, subject to certain exceptions. So what this is, is it is an effort at harmonizing on an international level um, among all of the different instruments. We are trying to find a way so that there is foreseeability that an award, once it has been rendered, the arbitration is over. It's then up to the courts to play a very limited role if there are grounds for recourse against an award. One of the main reasons for this functus officio doctrine is of course efficiency. Uh, and from the beginning, parties have chosen to go to international commercial arbitration uh, because they wanted to have a private decision maker that would render an efficient decision. They accept the fact that there may be errors of law and fact. And we know that those errors of law and fact are not grounds for preventing the enforcement of an award. So parties are opting for a different system than a court litigation system with its numerous levels of appeal. I think we also must recognize that adding this possibility for additional procedural steps after an award has been rendered will allow bad faith parties uh, to make requests as a means of delaying the process. And we heard Joe uh, Newhouse in our last panel say, parties will want to re-argue their cases. Uh, even if they're not bad faith. And Gabrielle kaufman Kohler also said, this is a very easy tactic for blocking procedures. And I'd say adding again this additional time, we have to look at how would that affect the running of statutory time limits for requests to set aside or enforce awards in different jurisdictions. We're just opening up the door to chaos. Looking at the quality of the award, uh, having this doctrine of functus officio requires arbitrators to make more effort to get it right the first time. And of course, mistakes may happen, but I personally, I have heard arbitrators who have said that the fact their award is gonna be reviewed by the ICC court through scrutiny, that will pick up any mistakes they make. 
So it, t- it puts a lot less pressure on the arbitrator to get it right the first time. Now, another ground that's put forward for functus officio uh, that's referred to in the City Bar Report is the possibility of ex party pressure on arbitrators uh, by parties requesting modifications. And that's traditionally viewed here in the US as one reason we want functus officio. I share the viewpoint of the city bar that that's a pretty cynical view of arbitrators, uh, that they're gonna be subject to that kind of pressure. But I do think we need to recognize that in a private decision, uh, private decision-making system, these decision makers are not public officials who are subject to the same level of scrutiny and they don't have the same protections that are built into the public system um, concerning the decisions that they take. And I would add on this point uh, that we have to remember for three member arbitral tribunals that in many cases, the arbitral tribunal is not unified. And there are different possibilities for pressure to be exerted on co-arbitrators after an award has been rendered. So in cases where we've already had difficulty in creating a consensus among the arbitral tribunal, that arbitrator who wants to take the position of the party that proposed them is just going to now have a wonderful chance to reopen everything that has been decided. So those are just some of the reasons I would argue that there are enormous benefits to the functus officio doctrine. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And I think after that uh, stirring performance, if we took the poll again, I doubt we'd have uh, <laughs> 40% who think it should be reformed. But now we're going to give equal time to uh, an alternative viewpoint. So Mark, are you persuaded by that passionate defense of functus officio, or do you think it's got its uh, negative issues? It, it, well, first, thank you very much. I am blown away by Anne-Marie here. It is hard to take for purposes of debate the position from the other side because she already balanced uh, or presented all these balanced arguments. Uh, thank you to the organizers also from my end and thank you especially to the organizers for celebrating New York as a place of arbitration by inference. Uh, all of us seated here in New York appreciate this very much and, and, and honor this occasion. I'm all for getting it right, even if I'm going to argue against uh, um, too many exceptions to the functus officius uh, uh, doctrine. Uh, then again, some say the experience uh, is the sum of all mistakes. <laughs> and I think that's by human nature what we have to address here, that uh, indeed uh, mistakes do happen. Uh, what I use um, for exceptions to functus officius is that a tribunal on its own motion having caught an obvious error, and that is an error in computation, clerical or typographical error, uh, should not be prevented from correcting itself on the strict timeline of 30 days, which I think you know, made it not only into the, uh, the, uh, uh, the ANSI trial model law, but also into most of the provider slip rules. Um, it, then again, Anne-Marie already touched on it, the uncertainty on whether slip rules toll the statutory three months or 90 day periods to bring set aside proceedings, um, I think argue uh, for limiting exceptions to the functus officius doctrine. Um, last but not least, the creativity council apply in attempting to re-argue a particular legal or evidentiary or even procedural point uh, is uh, what raises my hand of caution. Um, The AAA commercial rules, interestingly, actually expressly say that any um, application for a correction or interpretation uh, should not be used to redetermine the merits of any claim. Um, That is where slip rules can be uh, formulated appropriately and give the appropriate warning. Um, Another uh, issue of the functus uh, doctrine, I think, is when is an award sufficiently final? I'm sure we will revisit this issue going down uh, uh, the path of our debate here. Um, Last, uh, well, two more points uh, uh, in response to Anne-Marie's very convincing arguments. Um, Where does the exercise of jurisdiction of an arbitrator end? And how long does an arbitrator have to stay impartial and independent? we will visit the issue of at what point is the last moment that a challenge to an arbitrator can be brought. 
uh, later on today. Um, what 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 as advocates also of course always emphasizes where is the borderline where, where where is the end of a correction where is the end of an interpretation and let me be complete here i think the consensus amongst the slip rules is and in the unc trial model law this is picked up as well an interpretation is not permissible by the tribunal on its own motion um the common law practitioners will say there are inherent powers the tribunal enjoys to decide any issue of the dispute. Um, just closing on where are the borderlines of interpretation and correction, let me start with interpretation. As long as interpretation applications are no re-argument of conclusions, no new arguments are presented or new evidence, and it simply is indeed a clarification of an award by resolving any ambiguity and vagueness in the terms of the award, that would be a proper application for interpretation. On the correction end of things, Richard, you mentioned this, some of the rules do not only provide for errors in computation or clerical or typographical errors, but they have that interesting language of similar nature, errors of similar nature. I think here in New York, uh, we learned that when it comes to the computation of interest, this is where this language perhaps may be put to test. And that is if payments had been made, a repayment on a loan, would they have to be applied to interest first or to the underlying principle? And whether you do one or the other, of course, results in very different damages figures. <laughs> then I think we are at the borderline of, are we doing a computational correction? <laughs> Or are we, are we exercising judgment and applying certain payments to interest or principal? That's as much as I've got at this moment. Okay, well, thank you, Martin. I'll, I'll just note um, that those ambiguities in the slip rules and the, what their scope is, and the ambiguity in when a tribunal is or is not, uh, or when a, a decision, an award, is or is not final sufficient to trigger the functus officio doctrine or an analogous slip rule has been grist for lots and lots and lots of post-award litigation in the courts imposing the expense and the consumption of time. So whatever the merits of the underlying purposes that Henry has vigorously identified, there are some uh, burdens and expense associated with it. Eduardo, I know you wanted to add a point on this uh, general topic of the pros and cons, so please do. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Richard. And then let me also uh, thank the organizers for the very kind invitation to be here uh, with, with you all today. Um, I, I just wanted uh, to, to make a comment on, on the very lively debate that we just uh, experience between Anne-Marie and, and Martin. And uh, what I see is that there is a tension perhaps uh, between two values, both uh, important uh, in, in the international arbitration system, uh, which are the values of finality of decisions and then the value of the, the quality uh, of the arbitral justice, which was mentioned by, by Benno at the beginning of, of the conference. So if um, uh, we place uh, quality of uh, arbitral justice uh, in, a, in a higher place than uh, finality of, of decisions, uh, you may wish to, uh, uh, to have a doctrine such as the functus officio, which will give you more flexibility um, after the final award is rendered to uh, eventually get it right. Uh, and conversely, if you place uh, the value of finality, which seems to be the case in most uh, civil law jurisdictions, higher uh, than the quality of the arbitral justice, uh, you may want to limit as much as you can um, the post-award uh, remedies that arbitrators can, can use to, to, to correct. And, and so what I find very, very interesting is that normally um, in civil law jurisdictions, um, uh, we, we like uh, general doctrines uh, to keep some flexibility and 
normally in common law jurisdictions, you have more precise, pragmatic solutions. Uh, it looks to me that the city bar is, uh, is becoming somehow Frenchy. Fascinating. I must say, as a common law practitioner, I would have done just a 180 on which of the two approaches uh, prizes clarity and reliability versus flexibility. Richard, uh, if I could just jump in with one uh, final thought echoing uh, these, um, it would be that when I was first thinking about this question in the abstract, I went back and forth, you know, the perfect is the enemy of the good, but on the other hand, we've all put in so much effort uh, on this problem, why don't we go the extra mile to get it right? So I went back and forth, back and forth. But then when I actually looked at the examples, I thought this is not just one question. So as we get into those examples and see those different situations, I think speaking as a true common lawyer uh, in, in the concrete, you'll see uh, perhaps some different views. Well, okay, uh, Janet, thank you for that uh, uh, teaser for what's to come. Um, so look, we have the benefit of on this panel of, of two members who are uh, first both in the common law and the civil law traditions. And so I think we're curious to learn how the civil law uh, approach deals with the concept of functus officio, which is uh, rooted in very old England and therefore is a, a common law notion. So uh, I think Martin and Eduardo will educate us about the civil code approach to the functus officio concept. Martin. Thank you, Richard. Um, Indeed, I, I, I wear two hats uh, here with my German past, uh, still a member of the bar there, of course, and practicing German law. Um, I would uh, describe the civil law approach to be more an issue by issue approach. Um, once a matter in dispute has been decided, um, the arbitration agreement extinguishes as to that matter. <laughs> Um, now, that, of course, uh, makes every sharp mind quickly jump to, you know, the false cousin of the functus officius doctrine, which is the res judicata doctrine, uh, and turns the perspective towards at what point of time would relitigation or rearbitration be permissible. Um, let's, let's say a highlight from a different angle on the issue by issue approach is what the ancestral model law has successfully codified. Um, and Marie already emphasized um, the correction and interpretation of the award is addressed right after the termination of the proceedings in the model law. Article 32 is the termination of the proceedings. Article 33 is the correction and interpretation of the award. And perhaps for our discussion, very importantly, the next chapter uh, has the heading recourse against award. Um, so it is that in between um, that we are dealing with between a uh, abstract description of what the proceedings uh, are terminated by um, and what recourse is available against an award. Um, the terms there used are correction and interpretation. Um, Richard, you already uh, graciously uh, indicated that different slip rules, you know, have similar concepts and use slightly different wordings. Um, but the strict timeline in the interest of finality is picked up by the ANSI trial model law as well uh, by means of a 30 day rule. And as I pointed out, interpretations as such uh, wouldn't be permissible on its own motion by the tribunal, uh, corrections are. Um, turning over to where functus officius and res judicata uh, touch each other, sometimes even overlap, of course, um, an arbitrator may become functus without having accomplished the jurisdictional mission, um, which I think presents the borderlines there. A valid resignation is the end of the jurisdictional mission. Um, the challenge is successful is an end of the arbitrator's mandate. The parties waive their arbitration agreement and last but not least, I think in the context of settlement is where the real debate has to happen. Um, the civil lawyers then turn to the competence competence and would argue that 
arbitrators necessarily retain jurisdiction to decide whether a dispute was indeed settled. <laughs> and if you think that through to the end, does that mean that functus doesn't happen until an eternity? <laughs> With this, I would turn it over to Eduardo. <laughs> Only a few words uh, uh, from, from the French uh, Code of Civil Procedure, uh, which doesn't contain a general doctrine of uh, functus officio, but rather uh, a provision uh, allowing the parties to ask for interpretation, correction, and um, uh, also they can ask for an additional award in, in cases of uh, infra, infra petita uh, awards. Uh, the, the only perhaps, um, interesting feature uh, uh, of the French system is another remedy uh, which is provided in the code, which is the a potential revision of, of the award, uh, which uh, is not uh, a remedy um, universally adopted. Uh, and it is open in France when um, fraud is discovered in connection with arbitration after the final award uh, was rendered, and um, uh, you may you may recall this famous case uh, involving uh, Bernard Tapie, which uh, gave rise to probably the first uh, exercise of this revision remedy before before the French courts. So, um, Eduardo, I just want to clarify. So, the French code does not have a reference to functus officio, but it does have some limitation on the ability of a tribunal to revise an award, is that right? Uh, the French code has the, the classic um, remedies of interpretation, correction, and additional award. And it has another one, which is uh, rather unique, I believe, uh, in comparative law, which is the pot potential revision of the award in cases in which uh, fraud uh, is discovered after the rendering of the final award. Uh, it might be that um, um, one of the arbitrators was corrupt, for instance. It might be that one of the parties uh, uh, fraudulently withheld evidence, for instance. Uh, so that, that might be uh, the type of scenario that um, can, be, um, can be invoked to exercise that remedy. So there's that unique French code authorization to revise an award. Is that uh, confer the revision authority on the original tribunal, or is it the authority of the court? Yeah, is um, the the provision says that if the tribunal can be reconstituted, uh, it is the tribunal which has to um, decide on the revision of of the award. If the tribunal uh, cannot be reconstituted, um, the uh, courts that will have normally been competent to adjudicate the dispute, but for the arbitration agreement, uh, will have jurisdiction to decide on the revision of the award. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Janet, moving on, um, one question is whether the slip rules that we've been talking about are simply a codification of the common law on this officio doctrine or whether that is a misleading way to think about them. What, what is your view on that topic? Well, just very quickly to say that um, one of the issues that will come up is uh, when is the award final? When is the tribunal no longer able to act? i.e. functus, and do those arrive at the same moment? Because I guess part of the confusion is this very simplistic notion that once the award is issued, uh, it is final and the tribunal is sort of uh, dismissed and uh, the mandate is over. But in fact, we see with the slip rule that notwithstanding that the award might in fact be final and enforceable, that there is that sort of twilight period, uh, I won't say life support, but there is that sort of twilight period when the tribunal still could at least in theory have uh, a mandate and that's quite a short one. But um, as you'll see, it is, seems to be quite a short one, but indeed those 30 days or 28 days or whatever that period is, is quite a short period of time, but that's to alert 
that is to sort of, you know, uh, pull the fire alarm and say there's a problem or pull the emergency stop and say there's a problem. But if it ends up going to a court, it could be many, many months later. So the tribunal is sort of in that kind of potentially in that limbo and might actually be asked to reconvene many months later to remember what they did, to be rebriefed, and it, are, are they all still, you know, available? Are they all still alive? You know, and um, can they be recon reconstituted? And very interested to hear Eduardo's uh, point that in the French law, if they cannot be, it's not remitted to another tribunal. It goes to the court. So some very, very, uh, you know, odd situations can arise. Um, it's it's not as complex as, as we're making it, it is even more complex still when you think about all the ways in which it can actually arise in, in practice. Okay, but I have kind of a simplistic way of thinking. So I have been thinking that the slip rules are simply providers uh, way of implementing the underlying common law of this officio concept. Uh, but I think what I have heard you say is that under the a strict interpretation of the common law concept, the moment the third arbitrator of a three-person tribunal signs something labeled a final award, why that tribunal has performed its office, it is functus officio, and it is powerless to do anything else. And the slip rules start at the very moment at which the tribunal left to the common law would be this official is that your view or well, well let's, let's the, the provider rules actually are start with functus official as a baseline and uh and modify it well, well let's just say that the common law often starts with some very simple rules but it always allows itself opportunity to refine and adjust them when it actually has the real situation in front of it which is part of the problem that we're we're talking about throughout the throughout the session Okay, well, uh, I'll just share with the group that during uh, some of our prep sessions for this panel, I thought I was being persuaded that when the city bar references the report, uh, references the slip rules as the codification of the functus officio doctrine, that that really wasn't quite right. And uh, I think I understand an intellectual or theoretical basis for that, but I. Uh, on balance, I come out that it's okay. Any of our panelists that have a, a view on this uh, angels dancing on the head of a pin question? If not, we will move on. Although I think it's on the tip of Eduardo's tongue. Eduardo, you want to chime in from Paris? Yes, and and um, so I just I just wanted to report on a on a recent um, interesting article uh, written by. Uh, the former president of the ICC Court of Arbitration, uh, Alexi Moore, uh, which uh, is an article in which he uses the doctrine of functus officio. Um, and the article is uh, titled, uh, Should Post-Final Award Challenges Against Arbitrators Be Admitted? And, and let me very rapidly tell you what the factual matrix of, of the problem is, and then we can, we can go to uh, some, some considerations uh, on it. Uh, the factual matrix X uh, is that uh, uh, the tribunal has rendered uh, the final award, um, then the losing party um, is not happy, obviously, with the award, uh, and finds uh, some information uh, that can be used uh, to challenge uh, one uh, of the members of the tribunal, or, or at least at least one member uh, of the tribunal. Uh, on that basis, um, for the uh, arbitrator not to be functus officio, uh, the losing party requests uh, the interpretation or the correction of the final award in order to prolong, so to speak, the life of that arbitrator challenge him or her before the arbitral institution uh, in the hope that if the challenge is accepted, then uh, the way um, for the setting aside of the award would be much easier before any relevant court. So this is the tactic 
that uh, uh, Alexei in his article uh, doesn't like. And, and so he tries to find a way um, to tackle uh, that tactic. And the way uh, that he, he proposes is to say that uh, when uh, the tribunal renders the final award, it is functus officio with two exceptions. Uh, the first is when um, the decision is infra petita and there is a need for an additional award. And the second one is uh, the revision of the award that I just explained uh, on the French law. Uh, and he says that uh, in these two situations, uh, the tribunal cannot be functus officio because it has to exercise jurisdiction in the sense that it has to adjudicate a dispute between the parties. So the question is whether the tribunal is uh, functus officio uh, in a, a scenario where there is a, a request for interpretation or correction of the award. And he says that the tribunal is functus officio in those instances, because the tribunal, he says, does not exercise jurisdiction when correcting or interpreting an award. What he says is that the decision is already made in the final award. And what happens with the correction interpretation is simply that the tribunal says to the parties, well, I'm sorry I made this mistake and I'm, I'm correcting this mistake, or let me clarify what I already decided before. So uh, since there is no exercise of jurisdiction in answering uh, correction and interpretation request, uh, the tribunal is functus officio, so these uh, losing parties cannot uh, use correction interpretation to prolong the life of the arbitrator and challenges against uh, arbitrators on that basis should be declared um, inadmissible. Uh, one last word from me on, on this very interesting um, article. I, I disagree with the position of, uh, of Alexi. And I disagree because I find that um, in uh, debates regarding uh, especially interpretation of awards, there are disputes between the parties. Uh, I mean, we have all seen um, situations in which uh, one of the parties says, I am asking for interpretation of the award and the opposing side will say, this is not a request for interpretation. This is a, an appeal. And what the tribunal has to decide is precisely uh, where is the line between appeal and interpretation and make a decision. And I find um, on my part that by deciding that, that issue, which is obviously not as important as the entire dispute, um, the tribunal is exercising jurisdiction. But Alexei knows this problem and he's very intelligent as you all know. Uh, so he makes a distinction but that becomes a, a, bit, a bit theoretical in my mind between jurisdiction and authority. Um, so those who are deciding complicated issues of interpretation or correction are not exercising jurisdiction, but authority. But let me, may, let me leave this problem here, um, uh, Richard, because I, I don't think I'd be able to solve it. So the very fact that there is a disagreement on this topic between you, Eduardo, and Alexi Mora, the outgoing president of the ICC International Court of Arbitration, seems to be an illustration of why the 40% of the audience who thought maybe some reform is in order might be right. But we will get to that in a moment. I do want to spend a little time on the city bars reform proposal. But before we do, I think there are at least uh, two more. Oh, well, we have a question uh, to cite the name of the uh, Lexi Moore article. And I think they have it here. Uh, try to be responsive. Well, I don't have it here quickly. Uh, I can I can say the, the, the name of the article is uh, should post final awards uh, uh, should post final award challenges against arbitrators be admitted and it is it is published in the in the Liber Amicorum uh, uh, in honor of uh, Yves Derrance uh, editions uh, Pedon in France. Before we get to um... Uh, the city bar proposal and the panel's views on it. I just want to address two more topics. One is the distinction, if there is one, in the application of the provider slip rules and functus officio doctrine to partial final awards as opposed to final awards. And the second is because uh, 
I think we've had at least three references to the wonderful Latin phrase infra petita. I think we should at least spend a minute on what that means. But before we get to that, uh, on partial final awards, Janet, I think, uh, I think you have some views on that distinction in the context of the Funkus Officio doctrine. I think it may well be uh, a special case in all of this. My, my question to you, Eduardo, about uh, Alexi's article is why wouldn't we just say no? No, they should not be allowed to challenge. But in any event, we could, that would, that would uh, sort of obviate this entire discussion. So that would be a shame. But to speak about partial final awards, I must say I was very taken by uh, the discussion of Joseph's uh, proposal in the last session about episodic justice. Uh, you couldn't see me, but there I was nodding my head saying, you know, uh, arbitrators should get in there. They should be proactive. They should engage with the parties. And if they ask for early rulings on things, absolutely but be careful what you wish for. Because uh, just to give a, a, a sort of a real life example, uh, the Western Australia Supreme Court made a recent ruling that should be a, a occasionary lesson for all of us uh, in this area. Um, it was, uh, as is so often the case, not a small and simple matter, but a very large uh, and complex uh, offshore oil and gas case. And I must say, uh, you couldn't say for a moment that the tribunal was not uh, uh, a very senior and very capable, uh, an English judge who had uh, almost 50 years of experience as a construction lawyer, um, a, a former judge of the Western Australia uh, uh, court, um, and another uh, very capable arbitrator. And uh, they uh, had been persuaded by the parties for, for better or for worse. I think in this situation, arguably, uh, for, for worse, uh, to bifurcate the proceeding uh, and to render uh, you know, several awards or at least two awards. And so in the first award, which was meant to be uh, about uh, liability and not about quantum, they uh, rendered their determination. They went on to ask the parties uh, to provide uh, for damages submissions. And then uh, no sooner had they done so, uh, but one of the parties said, uh, but wait a second, you've included in your damages submissions uh, claims that were not fully, were not addressed uh, by the tribunal. Uh, surely uh, they are out of order. The tribunal is functus. And so uh, then the tribunal uh, makes some sort of initial ruling on that and goes on to make its second partial award. Off this goes to the court and to challenge the tribunal, uh, or at least should I say there is a dissent involved from the uh, former judge uh, from Western Australia um, that says, yes, indeed, the tribunal was functus, unable to consider these issues. And so we come back to Eduardo's uh, point about in these situations, who should decide? Should it be a court or should it be the tribunal? Now, let me just say that the court uh, in its uh, very careful uh, ruling uh, sided with the uh, dissenting arbitrator and said, yes, the tribunal was functus. In discussing what the majority had thought it had been doing in its first um, partial award, it said the first interim award had essentially been focused on resolving an in principle clash between the arguments seeking to establish an agreed rates basis for the labor cost reimbursement as against the contention that costs were to be assessed, uh, were to be reimbursed only on the basis of actual costs. It had done so in principle, but the tribunal, the majority had said, but there is no bright line or clear demarcation point as between liability and quantum issues in this dispute. And I must add for those who do construction disputes, that's often one of the reasons why they don't bifurcate because it can be difficult. The two uh, matters can become uh, quite, uh, yes, someone's calling out, is that the Chevron case? I should have named it, Chevron against CBI. For those who are listening to Australian Arbitration Week, you, were, you would have heard perhaps a slightly different view about this case from the one you're hearing now. Um, in any event, um, it said there was not a clear distinction between liability um, and uh, damages. And so having made its determination on an in principle basis, it now was assessing uh, the issues as they arose in the second partial award. The court said, of course, uh, no, you can't do that. Your ruling is your ruling. I can see what it is and you, you're stuck with it. And then I say, well, we're all very familiar with the notion of multiplicity. We say multiplicity can cause a mischief because you present 
one case in slightly different ways to two different tribunals or two different courts, you can get an inconsistent result. And yet when we bifurcate into one, into two or more parts, are we not effectively by ruling separate awards creating two or more different cases? Shouldn't we refuse to do that always? Well, the answer is we're prepared to, to do that in part because we're the same tribunal. We are in a position to interpret the res judicata effect, what was actually decided in our first award, whether it was decided on an in-principle basis, whether there are a, a slightly different cast to the issues now so that we're not rehearing and contradicting our, our previous determination. But when you interpose a court, an external body into this, you effectively get uh, that mischief uh, arising. So that's my sort of uh, provisional view on that. I would say the follow on to that, of course, is that um, you can imagine tribunals um, hearing this uh, being very cautious about bifurcation or at a minimum couching their rulings in this very clear sort of language of this is done on a provisional basis uh, and it's subject to um, our assessment of issues that might sound the same if they arise in the second phase and so on. So you can see that there might be some sort of defensive arbitrating going on as a result of this. And just one last point, you might think that this is sort of uh, something that never comes up, but indeed uh, uh, not long ago, I saw a situation in which a tribunal had made an in principle ruling, just as you might imagine with episodic justice, because the parties thought they wanted some guidelines for the procedure and the arbitration. And then later, when the issue came up for the arbitral tribunal in concreto, uh, of course, you can imagine immediately uh, one uh, uh, side began its submissions with law of the case. This is already decided. You're stuck with that ruling and you should find. Uh, and surely now the tribunal having actually uh, seen this uh, issue um, as it was, as it actually materialized, should be free to decide it um, as it as it wished to do so. So those are my uh, sort of preliminary thoughts on, on partial awards. So thank you, Janet. And it's wonderful to illustrate the seamless web of panels one and uh, Joseph Newhouse proposal for episodic justice and panel two with the interrelationship to whether all of those episodic uh, awards are going to tie the parties up in knots, uh, litigating whether the the panel is functus with respect to any of them. I will note that closer to home than, than Western Australia, Australia the, the notion of whether a partial final award uh, triggers the functus officio doctrine uh, was one of the two New York cases that spurred the, the city bar's recent report. That case is American International Specialty Lines Company against Allied Capital Corp. It ultimately went to the New York Court of Appeals, New York's highest court. Uh, but not before the intermediate appellate court had told the very distinguished tribunal that no, it could not change its mind on a partial final award on uh, liability, uh, even though it had been convinced that they'd made a mistake. Uh, the New York Court of Appeals reversed that, but it did so. The site is 35 New York 3rd 64, and that was published last year. Uh, but it did so on the technical ground that it wasn't really a partial final award. It wasn't really, uh, it had not formally followed a formal bifurcation. So uh, I promise, I, I do want in our waning uh, two minutes, uh, just I do want to chat about the city bar's rule, I promised uh, discussion of infra petita, but city bar rules can take precedence. And we're almost, our time is almost up, which is another way of saying we've almost performed our function here. Uh, so I want the panel's quick views on the city bar proposal to summarize it for our audience. It basically had four key features. Uh, and it's a proposal that the providers ought to change their rules to expand the grounds on which uh, parties and the tribunal on its own motion within a limited time period can revise an award if the tribunal is convinced the mistake has been made. So the four key features, it's an opt-in proposal. Rules wouldn't allow this in all circumstances. The rules would provide the parties at the outset of the case can opt in to expanding the grounds that the slip rule can be invoked after an award. Second, the grounds for correction are expanded from the ones we've been talking about to encompass 
uh, correcting any mistake that affects the outcome that arises from oversight, omission, or misapprehension of a matter of fact or law presented by one or more of the parties. Third, it imposes very tight time limits on this, and to respond to Anne Marie's criticism, it expressly provides that the time uh, uh, to seek judicial review is told. So there's no ambiguity about that. And four, in order to disincentivize abuses of this expanded basis for post-award complaints, it does fee shifting so that the, the party seeking the correction has to pay upfront all administrative and tribunal costs, and it doesn't get it back even if it prevails. Uh, and if it loses, it pays the other side's legal fees. So that is the city bar's proposal in a nutshell. And uh, do I have any comments from the panel? Anne Marie. So I'm uh, very interested in this proposal, but I, and those four characteristics you have just mentioned, Richard, but I do personally have difficulties with each of those four proposals. The first one, uh, this idea of opt in, I recognize what you're trying to do is take into account party autonomy. So if this is what the parties want, then they can make this choice. But I would say to you, let the parties then choose institutional rules that they want and not require all of the institutions to change. Uh, the, we already have institutions that allow for appellate rules, appellate bodies that will look at arbitrators' decisions. So if that's what the parties want, they should go to those institutions. And this idea of parties wanting, I think, an appellate body, we can see there have been studies done that show, for example, um, the English Arbitration Act, which allows parties to bring an appeal on points of law. Uh, studies have been done to show how infrequently that is actually done. Parties do not want the right to appeal an arbitration award. Again, coming back to my start, parties want finality. Uh, talking about time limits, you, as you say, I think it's a, a great effort to limit it to 60 days, but you have all kinds of questions of due process, I think that will come into play uh, because if it's a true request for rectification, not a request for correction or interpretation, you're going to have to let everybody have a chance to express their views. And you're going to have a three-member arbitral tribunal that needs to be able to deliberate in an appropriate way. So I think that trying to say 60 days, we're putting efficiency again here over what would actually have to take place during that process. And that last point on the costs, again, for me, this one, I have an especially difficult time accepting because what you're saying is a party who thinks there's a mistake, a party who's gotten a bad decision from an arbitral tribunal has to pay, has to pay for these arbitrators to correct something that they should have gotten right the first time. Why should these parties have to be paying for a sloppy job that arbitrators have done? The only reason that for me, anyone should pay is because they're making a frivolous request. And if that's the case, we shouldn't be even in this situation. So again, very interesting, many qualities to this report, but on those, and I didn't get to my fourth point, but I know I'm out of time. So uh, I would love to discuss this further because I, I do, I truly enjoyed uh, reading that City Bar report. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Emory, and you started us off and you're ending <laughs> up because we are already three minutes past our witching hour. I would like for those of those, those of you in the audience who are prepared to stay put, we'll take that second poll again, just to see whether uh, this discussion has altered anyone's views. So answer yes, leave well enough alone. If you are persuaded the current system is in good shape, and answer no, reform is warranted if you're persuaded otherwise. And of course, reform doesn't mean the city bar's uh, specific proposal necessarily. So let's get our votes of our 116 remaining participants and see whether this panel has actually moved any needles. Richard, I'll remind that uh, the first, uh, first poll was 60-40 for the yeses. Thank you. And with slightly fewer mm -hmm. responses, 
I will show you that it was a very slight change. <laughs> All right, well, so I think we've uh, learned a lesson that we can talk a lot and not change anything at all, in part because the panel thinks we should leave well enough alone, and so be it. On that note, it is my pleasure to thank uh, all the panelists. I, I had such a, a fun time uh, working with each of you and learned a lot, and I will now turn this over to Mr. Skolnick for final remarks. Thank you, Richard. I think you have the final um, CLE code. Oh, thank you. Yes, there are some people have tuned off without hearing it, and I apologize for that. The final CLE code is 405AR. The numbers 405, the letters AR. I apologize for not doing it soon. That is fine. That was a good reason for uh, among many for people to stay through the end. Um, and I'm sure this conversation will keep going um, and we'll have a discussion offline as to whether the slip rules um, change the common law or codify it uh, over drinks, I hope. Um, so I want to thank um, both panels for an amazing job on some very complicated issues and um, a lively discussion and giving us lots to think about. Um, as you know, the entire week Week is organized by a committee appointed by NIAC and the Charter Institute New York branch. This particular program was organized by those two entities. And I want to thank everybody from both entities and from all the participants for putting together uh, such a terrific show and uh, such a terrific presentation, I should say. And um, and finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank our uh, sponsors and participating organizations. So we're about the middle of New York Arbitration Week and uh, hope to see many of you at uh, future programming and at the closing reception on Friday. So with that, um, I think we're, unless Reiko or FTI has anything that I missed, we're gonna close this session. Let's go ahead and close. Thank you so much, everyone. It has been- Okay, bye everyone. Nice to see you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.